And we're live. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to Leaning Into the Higher View. It's Friday night. That means it's time for some uh, great information, some great girl talk and um, from a higher view. We always want to look at everything from a higher perspective. And we have such an exciting guest tonight. I'm Cheryl Pruitt and I'm in Dallas. I'm part of the leadership of the higher view. We're a women's movement that um, when, uh, seeks to empower women and bring them up in the kingdom. So um, we're joined tonight by An Andrea Thompson. Andrea, we're so glad to have you. I can't wait to hear your story and everything nice. you've got going on. Uh, well, Cheryl and Heather, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here with you guys this evening. I am honored. Yeah, Heather is, I mean, uh, um, Andrea is a, an author and a speaker, and we've got a couple of books that she's written here. I am resilient and how I beat cancer. And she sounds like a warrior woman to me. Yes. Um, <laughs> glad to have you back. We've missed you. I what, know. What's been going on? Cheryl, I've missed you too. And I've missed you ladies. It's so good to be back on, back in the saddle. <laughs> I always love working with you, Cheryl. And uh, it's such a joy and blessing. I think last time I was on, we were talking about the Jewish um, calendar, mm -hmm. which was a great show. Learned a lot there myself. Um, yeah, so I have been busy. I think um, a lot of la ladies know that um, my husband and I and my family are building a family discipleship ministry. And a lot of my extra time is going into that. Um, I'm also writing a book. I know, Cheryl, you and I have a similar heart um, on forgiveness. I'm writing a book on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So I'm inspired by Andrea. Has written two books. Um, <laughs> and also, let's see, last week and I had the blessed opportunity for all of us, you know, during this COVID season, we've had to do so much ministry online, which of course there's blessings to that. But I'm sure if you're like me, you really miss being in person and, and doing those women's events that I know I did quite a few of those in my past. So um, last weekend I got to go to uh, Colorado Springs and mm. do a women's retreat at a, actually at a literal castle. I don't know if any of you have heard of Glen Erie, which is in Colorado Springs, as I said, but it's a, it's a, it's a retreat retreat center, 700 acres with an actual castle that Billy Graham acquired years ago oh, as a wow. retreat center. And it was just so, it was epic. <laughs> it was awesome. beautiful. We got to see um, mountain goats in live in their live habitat, roaming on the red rocks and um, just such beauty outside and inside the castle. We did high tea um, in my, <laughs> and my topic for the weekend was heart healing. So we had a lot of powerful um, transformation and healing in the Lord. Um, just so thankful for how the Holy Spirit, um, as we were talking off camera, Andrea, we have to allow God to do his work. And these ladies yes. this weekend um, are really brave in allowing the Lord in, oh, into some deep places so of, of wounding. And he, he just showed up big. So it was awesome. That's amazing. That's yeah. wonderful. So yes. good. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're really glad to have you back. So Thank we've you. got so much to cover tonight. Andrew, I know. You may be here all night long. <laughs> Get your popcorn and uh, juice. <laughs> And I also just wanted to give Cheryl some credit here because Cheryl, you really are such a hard worker behind the scenes, setting all this stuff up. So thank you so much for how you just, you know, serve with such excellence in making this all happen. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. I really do. Well, it's a lot of fun and we get to meet people like Andrea, yes. uh, you know, so uh, Andrea, I, we're going to talk about breast cancer awareness. That's where we're going to start. We've got a lot of places we want to go, but October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And all of our um, viewers, whether they're male or female, what part of the country they live in, they have probably already seen about 10,000 pink ribbons, in, you know, just since the 1st of October. And so these little pink ribbons are everywhere so that we're aware of breast cancer. Hmm. And um, I had a very dear friend that uh, had breast cancer several years ago and went through um, her, her treatment. Her name was Denise McIntosh. And I want to dedicate this program to her tonight because she was just such mm -hmm. a wonderful, amazing woman. And she would love you, Andrea, and you would love her. Um, but I, I learned more about it, you know, when, when you go through something like that um, with somebody so close. And I just began to learn there was really a lot that we could know that we weren't being told. Yeah. And we weren't being told really what there's a political agenda behind the pink ribbons. Um, 
And you said something on the uh, phone the other night, Andrew, we we're talking about, um, you know, awareness is not prevention. So there's just so much that, that's really one of the reasons I wanted to talk. But why don't you just introduce yourself now and then we'll just get started with your story. Wonderful. I'm Andrea. <laughs> uh, again, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, so uh, as far as just a little bit of my background, just to get the credentials, um, I'm a board certified physical therapist. That's what my, my degree is in. I'm certified in the psychology of eating and nutrition. And um, I'm an integrative health practitioner uh, working on getting board certified for that as well. But I think the thing that qualifies me probably most to speak about what we are going to tonight is the fact that I am somebody who overcame cancer. Uh, it wasn't breast cancer, but it, it really, it doesn't matter what the cancer is, it's cancer, it was cervical cancer. And I was diagnosed uh, back on August 1st, 2012. And I was given a prognosis of a year at best to live at that time. So I was 42 years old, uh, diagnosed, uh, newly remarried, uh, three years in, I have two beautiful kids. My, my oldest son is uh, going to be 28 next month. My youngest daughter's 23. And so for me, I'm like, uh, how does this happen? I, I was a seemingly healthy individual. I've, I'm a third degree black belt in, in Taekwondo. So I was extremely active. I competed nationally, internationally. And so to get a diagnosis like that really just took me for a loop. And just really quick, I'll never forget the night or the day. I was actually diagnosed in the Phoenix airport at 8.30 in the morning on August 1st. You, you just don't forget those things. And I remember that evening at the time I was living in Kansas City and I was flying out to Los Angeles for a, a, a Christian conference. And I just remember that evening, I, I got on the floor on my hands and knees and I clenched my fists. And um, the other book that I have, my very first book that I have, Jesus Girl Doing Real Life, I, I talk about all the things that I went through. So I'm clenching my fists and I'm like, Lord, you've gotten me through over 20 years of physical, emotional, verbal, uh, sexual abuse. Um, you, my father abandoned me in my teens. I had been uh, divorced once. I, you know, there was. I was a hundred pounds overweight. I, I've had an eating disorder. I was uh, forced into the sex industry for ten years of my life, and then at forty-two years old, I get diagnosed with cancer. And so I'm clenching my fists, and I'm like are you kidding me? Like, this is a thing that's going to take me out cancer. I, I'm like, why me and why now? And it was at that moment, it was the second time in my life that I'd ever heard the audible voice of God say, why not you? And why not now? And so I knew at that point, this journey was uh, not just about me. <laughs> and that took, you know, I was always into health, always into nutrition. I mean, my degree in, 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 you know, being in physical therapy, it was about rehabbing the body back to where it was prior to an injury or surgery. So I always had some sort of idea. I knew for me, that building the body up and destroying it at the same time is just not an option. And so I went on this journey. It's now going on eight years. So ha, hallelujah. I, I always say it looked pretty good for a dead person. <laughs> you know, even on my worst hair day. Um, and, and those were like for me when I was diagnosed and for a lot of people, the very first thing that you think of is you're going to die. You know, and of course, then they tell you, you've got about a year to live. And then the second thing was the thought of losing my hair. So that's why I joke about it. But I'm really pretty for sure that the thought of losing my hair was actually before thinking that I would die. <laughs> Let's just be real, right? <laughs> and so this just took me on a journey of, I kept saying, why did I get cancer? And then Lord, how did I overcome all of these other things in life? So what do I do? And so I wouldn't, I just didn't stop at the why. I wanted to know then how. So once I learned about the whys, I learned that the hows were very doable. And when I started to begin to learn and understand what cancer truly is and how and how it was able to get into my body and to live and to grow and you know there was an environment created that was conducive for that to live and grow. 
And so I learned through um, some incredible people and doctors that God brought into my path that I just needed to recreate an environment that wasn't conducive for cancer to live. And I haven't found that a pink ribbon has done that yet. Um, so, and, and I'm not here to bash any, I mean, a lot of people, I believe have a heart or their, their intentions mm -hmm. to support that is, is right. It's just that they're just not truly understanding what it is that is being supported or where the, those funds are going and being allocated. So um, that's where my issue comes in because since the 1960s, cancer has, it, it's doubled. The amount of breast cancer uh, since the 80s has just multiplied. So I'm like, where's it, where, what is all this awareness doing? Because it hasn't gotten us to a place where we're actually reversing it and we should be leading in that. That should be the norm. Ha getting breast cancer, being diagnosed with any cancer should not be the norm. And right now, one out of two men, one out of three women, 46 children every single day, 1,664 people are dying every single day of cancer, which is not being talked about. And so for me, I'm just not okay with that. And I really don't believe God is either because that wasn't the original design of, you know, and we're, we're built, we're created to heal. We just need to know how to remove the interference, get to the root causes of things and allow the body to do what it was always designed to do, which was to heal. You know, the thing that, um, I mean, what made my head spin when, um, I was going through this with my friend Denise is that a PET scan is, and you can find this on Wikipedia, WebMD, or anything. And and Andrew, if you tell me what the PET stands for, do you know right off? The yeah. So it's it's a type of diagnostic tool that um, goes in. And the, here's the thing: the number one feeder of cancer is glucose. Okay, healthy cells take in oxygen. That's the number one fuel for healthy cells. Cancer cannot survive in an oxygenated environment. And there's over 30 different receptor sites on a cancer cell. And it's only source of fuel that is needed is glucose, sugar. So when you do a PET scan, what they're doing is they're injecting you with radioactive sugar, period. So what's happening, it's like a Pac-Man thing. It's like you introduce the body, introduce sugar to the body. Um, the body, the cancer will then go to that because that's what it wants to eat. And then it'll light up on that scan. And that's how you can see where the cancer is. Now, not all the cancer, okay? Because that test doesn't show you at a cellular level and in the bloodstream if there's cancer and cancer systemic. So we can say breast cancer, we can say cervical cancer or colon cancer, but that does not mean that it's isolated in that area. And it doesn't mean what I've had to, um, so I'm a health coach, I'm a health advocate. I, you know, I'm, I'm about bringing truth and education so people can make the best decision for them based out of education and truth and not fear, period. I'm not here to tell anybody what to do, what not to do, but just to provide all this information. And I'm not a doctor, so I don't diagnose and I right. don't treat. But right. my partner is the leading cellular biologist in the world. So I have, I have I've learned a lot. <laughs> well, I, and I, I want to, I want to talk about him too. And I, I know you've got a lot going on with him, but when I realized that a PET scan was sugar and they diagnose you with radioactive sugar. That is not a secret. If you can understand the word glucose, it's yeah. everywhere. Now, if, if that little bit of information was on every billboard, every place that had a pink ribbon, that's the point I wanted to get to is if, that's all they would have to spend that $250 million a year that they raise, you know, is to tell people that sugar feeds cancer and we'd be way ahead of the game. So, um, yeah. So you, you, uh, you, I'd like to know, like when you got that call 
was that from a regular doctor? And then how did you get from there to immediately going down the natural route? Give us uh, a, a little bit of that story. So um, my, my gynecologist, I went in for an exam. So during this time, just to give you a little backstory real quick, I had, you know, you go in for your, your yearly pap, uh, pap smears. And so I had gone in at one, at one point, uh, which would have been in 2008. And I would, I had, I'd never had a normal um, pap smear that I can ever remember from the time that I ever had them. But there was never anything that really came up. It would just say some abnormal cells. My doctors would say, no big deal. We'll just keep an eye on it. So in 2008, I had a low-grade abnormal pap smear. Four years later, in between those four years, I was going through a divorce. I was living on my own. I didn't have health insurance. There was a lot of different things. So I did not go to the doctor for four years. So it wasn't like I said, oh, I feel like I have cancer. I need to go check that out. Cancer... Um, can grow and be in the body 10 to 30 years before it's actually diagnosed. Okay. So it's, you know, our body has perceives 10% of feelings and pain and things like that. So it's a, it's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not a great indicator. And so when four years later, when I went in for the pap smear, I wound up having a high grade abnormal pap smear. So they wanted to do biopsy, things like that. So my doctor had been my doctor for over 20 years. It wasn't like just some random person I went to. We had gone to church together. We, you know, all, by the way, I'm a Jewish girl. So I love the fact, just sidetrack. I wish I could have been there to hear about the whole Jewish calendar. Uh, so anyway, um, we, he called, he was the one that said, you know, Hey, Andrea, when I was in the airport, so it wasn't like just some random doctor saying, he goes, you know, I got your test results back and I'm sorry to tell you, but you have cancer and we need to take some significant measures. And so at that point, um, my husband and I went into his office. He gave you know me all the options and he was just like, if you do not do chemo and radiation, you're going to die within a year. We need to have surgery. We need you to remove the tumor. Uh, we talked about hysterectomy. We talked about all the things. And so it was kind of like, ah, all right, I need to step back here. And luckily, he was a man that knew that I was going to do what I wanted to do anyway. <laughs> but he was still going to tell me everything because that was his obligation. So I do appreciate that from him on both sides of honoring me, but yet being who he is. And I went back and I just started praying and I just said, you know, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because I know that I cannot build the body up and destroy it at the same time. So for me, that meant chemo and radiation. I knew enough through going through enough medical schooling, you know, what it was, what it did to the body. And I said, I, that's just not an option for me. Um, I did have the tumor removed surgically. That was the only thing that I did as far as traditional medicine. Uh, one of the things and one of the reasons was it wasn't because I knew that if I removed the tumor, um, that cancer would be gone since cancer is systemic. But the cervix is one of the organs that actually grows back. So by removing that tumor, I my cervix would grow back. That didn't mean that I was done and out of the picture because the bottom line is you have to get to the root causes. So from there, I met a, a lady who became um, my health coach. I'm, she was 19 at the time. I was 42. Now she works for, for us as a personal health instructor. So it's really awesome how God just works that out. She introduced me to a chiropractor and a, a naturopathic doctor in Kansas City. And it was the chiropractor that introduced me to an amazing man, Dr. Raymond Helu, who's a medical doctor. He um, is the leading cellular biologist in the world. And then, and so the option was, hey, let's send a couple drops of your blood to Spain. He analyzes an, it under a microscope. He magnifies the blood 65,000 times. Like you can't even imagine like how gigantic that is. You can see everything at that, at that, le at that level. And so he can see every imbalance and abnormality at a cellular level that has the potential to provoke disease. Okay. Now for me, it was cancer. For other people, it could be something neurological, some other autoimmune, something going on in the uh, in the gut, something going on. And, I mean, you name it, put any label you want to it. So it's not that he was a cancer doctor, so to speak. But when you can find the root causes of why that label was created, that's where the cure is. 
It's not but, in the say that last thing again. When you find what? Say that again. When you find the the causes, the imbalances and abnormalities yeah. of yeah. why the label of cancer or whatever label is there was provoked, that's the cure. The cure is correcting the imbalances and abnormalities that created the cancer in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. That, yeah. Can, can, I, can I ask you yeah. a question? Okay. <laughs> so at this point, it's so interesting. So my cousin, um, she's a wonderful Christian woman, um, 42, just was diagnosed um, over a year ago with, about a year and a half ago now, mm -hmm. with breast cancer. Praise God, she's mm -hmm. cancer-free now. Um, but there's mm -hmm. no family history. Um, there was no, um, you know, they ruled everything out and they said it had to be environmentally yeah. Yeah. caused. And so, um, and, you know, so she it was the most aggressive kind of cancer. She did go through, it was, a, you know, practically a stage three, not quite a stage three, but right there. And, um, you know, she did go through chemotherapy. I went down to um, San Diego and spent time with her and went to her appointments and, and tried to help her through that as best I could. Um, and it was arduous, as you can well yeah. imagine, you know, yes. what, the, what that treatment is like. And it, it does destroy your body. Yes. Praise God, though, she's totally cancer-free, absolutely. Um, but... Um, I'd like to understand a little bit more about environmental causes. Can you elaborate on that? And then also, in addition to that, you should, yeah. I just happened <laughs> to have some information on that. Good, good. And then the other thing was, and I think you've given us a hint, but the other thing you said early on was that um, there's a right environment for cancer to grow. So you can talk yeah. about environmental and then what that environment is. Yes. So let me, okay. So you've, you've opened the door to a lot of yeah. things. So let me, um, I'm going to just highlight a couple things. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, there is not never, never one thing that can create a, a, a disease. It's always multifaceted. Cancer is multifaceted. Now, Dr. Hilu and I, like I have a master class that, that is being released through subscription that talks about the four main pillars. Okay. So you have, so think of a table with four legs, the legs of a table. Each of those four legs represents these four pillars. So you have diet, you have contamination, which is toxicity. That's um, physical toxicity, environmental toxicity, emotional toxicity, verbal toxicity, uh, and anything toxic. Okay. Cause everything, everything in, that we are exposed to, whether it's food, thoughts, words, uh, inhaling things, all has to go into the body and biochemically change into things that, and then the body has to do something with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have diet contamination, stress, and in 100% of all the over 200,000 um, my analysis is that Dr. Helu has done and every cancer patient that he has seen, stress is always, always present, no matter, okay? Whether we feel stressed or not, but our cells tell a different story sometimes. And then fourth is genetics. You hit on something, 98% of all diseases lifestyle, only 2% of it is genetic. But we even know enough now through epigenetics that genes express themselves in the environment that they live in. So there was an environment created for cancer to live in my body. There was an environment created for your friend, for your friend, for family members, for so many millions of people for cancer to live. So it's very important that we go through getting all, here's the thing chemo radiation, even if a person chooses to do that, that doesn't correct the imbalances and abnormalities in the environment in the first place. That's eradicating what's yeah. there, right? So we still have to, I tell people this all the time, whatever route you choose, okay? I'm talking about people that have been diagnosed or have gone through it because we've seen this. I have helped thousands of people. I have we have thousands of clients. I cannot tell you daily how many people come to us regarding cancer alone, let alone everything else. But we're just, so like October's cancer awareness, well, we're aware of it every single day. Yeah. And we're helping people every single day, nonstop. I, 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 Miriam, who, who Cheryl has known, I mean, she's, she works 40 hours a week. All she does is answer questions and emails. That's it. Um, so 
we have to be able to find out what is the environment inside. What are the things that we're exposed to? Internally, what are the things we're knowingly and unknowingly? Because I always say this, it's never about uh, shame or condemnation because I can tell you that I, I can t lead you down my path of how cancer was created because I now know. There were that abuse that I mentioned, that abandonment I mentioned, and then there was a time where I was so messed up mentally that I thought that if I stayed in a perpetual state of sickness and said to the people that I wanted to love me so, that I was going to die of a female disease because I would have so many problems. I was declaring that verbally and the body has to do something now. So I had to deal with that because that was something that my body and that environment was like favorable. That was preparing the way for that. And then lo and behold, I, I get cancer. It's not the only thing. Um, just like I talk about in my book, How I Beat Cancer, the five main keys that I went through. So we have to look at all of these things, all of the imbalances, all the abnormalities that are created. Unless this is the best prevention tool, because I don't want anybody to ever, ever have to go through hearing the words, you have cancer and you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people, I'm sorry to say, that have died that didn't have to die. The majority of people don't even die from the cancer. The only... The only, it's very rare to die from cancer. The only way that a person actually can die from cancer is if the tumor is actually blocking air supply, blood supply, that's, that's how. All, all the other stuff is from side effects and things that come from other things. And the imbalances and abnormalities that have been left unsaid, because if you don't correct those, no matter what I did, the holistic route, or if somebody does a traditional route or a combination of both, you still have to maintain an environment that's not conducive for disease, cancer, or anything to live. Well, so true. And, um, you know, I keep going back to the sugar thing, but, you know, when people are diagnosed, um, because a lot of times or very rarely do they get any nutritional advice from their doctor. Yeah. You know, people are yeah. taking them yeah. cakes and cookies and all of those things. Just eat, just eat, just let them eat. They just, yeah, need, to yeah, eat. They just need to eat. And, um, uh, or, you know, people will celebrate now that they're cancer free, which we could probably talk about. That's probably really not such a thing, really, because there's, you know, always something kind of left in there. But, um, you know, then they'll celebrate. They'll start drinking again or, you know, even if it wasn't a lot. But you know what I mean? And then you see pictures of the chemo treatment rooms with the sugar and the cookies and all of that stuff. And it just really made me so angry because I thought this is just not fair for people to not know that, but that's what we're here tonight. To right. Well, exactly. And we have to, you know, we have to understand first of all that in medical school, um, the majority of schools get less than 20 hours of nutrition courses. Okay. So here's the thing, because so I, I can get upset too, you know, but I, we can only, it's like, we can only give what we have. We can only ex give knowledge of what we know. And, and so th things are limited. Uh, knowledge is limited because they're not learning that. And that's why when we have these integrative and functional medical doctors and actual medical doctors who see the body as a whole and not a system of parts and can actually go, oh, the body actually can heal and oh, it actually doesn't have to be disease and we can do something about it instead of relying on things that have a negative effect. Very rarely do chemo drugs work. They may prolong life for a short amount of time, usually, but it comes out of very, no matter what, it comes at a very, very high price to that person and their, that person's body. The great thing is, is that we can work with that too, as far as we can see the integrity of the tissue and the cells and Dr. Helu can work with that. Um, but if, if we're going, to, the goal is to kill cancer, right? How do you kill something? You have to starve it. So you can't continue to feed it with the number one fuel. But stress is a fuel of cancer. 
and like environmental toxins inside of our home. I just did a live uh, yesterday and talked about this, Heather. I, I went through be, because one of the things is a lot of people are home more. Moms are home more. Kids are at home more now with the COVID and schooling and social distancing. So our homes are actually way more toxic, the environment, the air that we breathe. I mean, we breathe. And uh, what was, let me, I, I wrote down this number. I want to get it right because I like to get things right. I work I work in excellence. I, I, I have a chapter in my book on perfectionism that doesn't work. That too will, will food cancer. So we just work in the spirit of excellence. Um, but we breathe in 10 to 20,000 liters of of air per day. And so if we're going, and if most of our time is spent in the house, then there are things that we can do. So we don't want to be fanatics. We don't want to be afraid. We don't want to be fearful. But if we can begin to eliminate a little bit of that toxic overload that creates disease of the body, that creates cancer, then we can begin to reverse that environment and create an environment that's not conducive for cancer to ever be in. And it is something that I have to do my whole life, but it doesn't mean I'm in prison to it or I'm in fear of it. It's that I now get to steward the gift of life that God has given me. I've learned the things, listen, we put things into our body. It, the bottom line is, and I know sometimes this can offend people, but we're either putting life into our body or death, period. And that's from emotions, thoughts, food, what we're breathing in, all that stuff. So we have a choice. And if we can begin to eliminate those things that create a burden inside of the body, then we begin to lighten the load and then allow the body to do what it was always designed to do, which was to heal. If the body's always in a fight or flight pattern, because our immune systems are a war, they're soldiers. And if they're constantly fighting a battle and never able to rest and repair, then our bodies are going to constantly be at war. And it never is going to have time to rest, repair, renew, rebuild where it actually needs to be. So if we can begin to lighten the load and the burden of these environments. So one of the things that I talk about is toxicity and environmental toxicity. Where is that at? Well, did you know that the number one leading cause of children um, poisoning is Dawn detergent. Dawn soap is the number one. Yeah, it's it, and and so though, like I said yesterday, the products that I use are not toxic. So if my grandson, who's one, goes under there, which we make sure he doesn't just play with them, but if he were to go in there and ingest those. I know that he is not, number one, breathing those toxins in because everything off gases all the time. And I know that he's not poisoning himself. So there are things we can, practical things, easy, easy things that we can begin to do to eliminate those toxins. Air fresheners in the air, burning candles that are have synthetics in them, um, not having the air cleaned out, living in a place with mold. Um, you know, there's... What is it we're, there's what we're breathing, you know, we're wearing the masks and I, can I, can I just say something about the masks? Please, please okay. do. Okay. So Dr. Helu and I wrote an ebook that was actually inspired by a couple live interviews that I did with him. And you can find those on my YouTube channel. You can find them also on my Instagram, um, IGTV. But we wound up writing a free ebook. You can download it right off my website, andreathompson.org, no cost to you. And it's about building your immune system. And we talked about this. Now, people need to understand, first of all, there's about seven different types of masks. I know we're kind of going, so I hope that's okay. Or just hey, tell me to be quiet and if you, whatever you want to talk about. I'm loving it. Okay. So there are seven different types of masks that are made. Only two of them are actually um, available to the general public. Okay. So you see like the blue, there's only about two of them. Now, here's the deal. There's only two masks that actually can prevent and would be a good use for the coronavirus. Okay, so I'm speaking about this one. Um, because the porosity of the masks that 
people are wearing, they're making up, they're coming up with, they're buying because they're pretty, they're doing because they're promoting something. It's ridiculous. Like these are not even proven. Like they're just wearing them. And those surgical blue masks, those don't prevent the, the porosity and the, the micron of a, the, the, vir the coronavirus, which, you know, there's 39 different strands of coronavirus, this particular one. And, you know, and coronavirus has actually been around since the 60s, okay? But the, so the porosity of the mask, that means the, the porous, the size, the holes of the mask, and then the micron size of the coronavirus, it's the, it, it's the coronavirus is, can't, it doesn't go through that. They're not the same. They're not the right size. So it's just, I mean, so it's not blocking it. It's going through it is what I meant to say. So you have a mask that, that porosity is, is open. It's like the, it's like, okay, if you took a grape and just let, and just have this analogy that the size of the coronavirus is a grape, the size of a grape. And then you took cheesecloth. You know, cheesecloth is very fine, tight fibers, okay? So if you had the right mask, that grape, that coronavirus, okay, right, can't penetrate. If it is a uh, chicken wire, so to speak, okay, it can pass through. So which size do you want? You want the cheesecloth, right? Well, the masks that we're, we're wearing, that people are wearing, the collective we, the man-made this, the handkerchiefs, they're ineffective because the size, the, the porosity of the mask or what you're using and the size of the coronavirus micron, it's useless. Now, people will say, but surgeons wear it. Well, Dr. Helu, he's a stem cell surgeon. Of course he is. But that's because during surgery, he's making sure that his, his, his things aren't getting into an open wound. And then anything that is opened in a patient is not getting back on him. Totally different. Plus, he's not wearing that mask 24 seven. Plus, it's, listen, cancer, cannot survive in an oxygenated environment. It hates oxygen. This is why we put oxygen into the body. A person that has cancer, when we look at their analysis, their cell analysis, we find that they're hypoxic. That means there's lack, there's low oxygen levels. Okay. Cancer thrives in that non-oxygenated environment. So for me, who needs to make sure I'm constantly getting oxygen. If I'm wearing a mask all the time, I'm blocking the oxygen going into my body. I'm cre I'm, I'm ingesting, I'm, I'm breathing back in the carbon dioxide, which is dangerous. And now I'm, do you see, I'm beginning to recreate an environment for cancer to be conducive. I can't afford that. None of us really can afford that. Um, you asked me, so that's my little take on that. You also asked me cancer, cannot survive. It loves an acidic environment. So if you're drinking lots of caffeine, if you're stressed out, if you have a high sugar diet, a high carbohydrate diet, a high protein diet, meats, red meat, chicken, turkey, animal protein. I'm not saying you can't have this. I'm just saying these are the more acidic foods. That's creating an environment that is conducive, that has the potential to provoke dis-ease of the body. So we want to make sure we're having a more alkaline body. We're removing all the acidity. Some people have what's called acidosis. We can see that in the blood. That's actually a genetic component. So it doesn't mean they have to be acidic, but it means if you're feeding the body with more acidic things, then the body has a propensity to become even more acidic than and, and that somebody that doesn't carry that type of gene. Uh, let's go to the, let's go to the BRCA genes, the BRCA one and two genes, what basically stands for breast cancer gene one and two. I have it. I have the one and two. Does that mean I'm going to get breast cancer? No. And in fact, 
what people don't know, and if they would use that $250 million that Susan G. Komen raises every year to teach about this, people would understand that those genes are actually very protective genes against breast cancer. But what happens is through environment, through food, through the sugar, through stress, through all those things, that gene can turn on or it can turn off. Okay. If it turns off, it'll express itself negatively and leave the body open for the potential for breast cancer to be provoked. So just because you have that gene marker doesn't mean you are going to get cancer. And we know some famous people that have went and have had mastectomies, even without being diagnosed with cancer to prevent it. But that doesn't prevent cancer because cancer is systemic and cancer requires multi things for it to happen. So we can't just cut off body parts and expect cancer never to come there. Does that make sense? My husband actually calls it the spirit of Frankenstein, if you want to be honest. Yeah. Because yeah. we can mutilate the body. And, and I mean this with all respect, because listen, I have people that I coach that are my clients that have gone through mastectomies. I honor what they did. But as long as we understand that that isn't the cure for cancer, we need to be able to do the other things too that will keep that body from preventing it. So, so Andrea, what would a doctor say who doesn't agree with what you're saying? You know, like, so a doctor <laughs> that doesn't believe in, in these factors. I mean, I know this is kind of a, a large topic too, but, you know, so for an example, the celebrities that have had their breasts removed as a preventative. So they were advised to do that, I'm sure, by their doctor. So what would you, what, what, are, what is the other side of their story? What are they saying that would, you know, encourage someone to do that? Well, until God tells me otherwise, I believe that cancer is the most fear-based disease on the planet. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, in effect, let me, and, and cancer, by the way, is not a disease. It's a symptom of the imbalances and abnormalities that took. So let's, so, but people know it as, so we'll just say it, it's a disease. So it's the most fear-based because the first thing you think of is you're going to die. You're going to lose your hair. Your quality of life is going to go down, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so they operate in that fear. Now, I'm not saying every doctor does. I know that there are oncologists that are doing their job. This is what they know. This is what they see. The majority of the patients they see, their patients wind up dying. Dr. Helu will say that oncologists are the only ones that carry a license to kill because they don't have any consequences. They know what cancer is but it's not how they have been taught. They've been taught that nutrition, that food doesn't play an issue. They're taught that mammograms are, are you know, one of the best things that you can do when in reality they have a 50 for 50%, over 50% false positive. So can you imagine the stress that that adds to someone, especially if they're making a decision to do something like a mastectomy, something that's, you know, whereas they wouldn't have to. Um, they can miss the mark as far as even other things being found in there. Um, so we have that with mammograms, PET scans, like you said, we've talked about our radioactive sugar. So what are you doing? You're feeding the sugar. Now, I'm going to tell you, there are times when we do need to use some diagnostic to so, some testing in conjunction with the cellular analysis. But the great thing is, is that we have a doctor because we use advanced medicine and investigative medicine. So we can actually help people. If people have to go through PET scans, if they have to go through, you know, whatever, we can help them rid their body of those toxins so they don't have to have that in their system all the time. Um, you know, they just, they, they believe the body's a system apart. So if, if you're, if breast cancer is breast cancer, that's where it is. But we know that that's not true. We've, Dr. Helu, he has been able to see through the blood where somebody comes for breast cancer and he can find cancer in somebody's toe. Like, I'm not kidding you. Um, so, and can these two things work together? They can. There are very few chemotherapy drugs that can work, or at least we can monitor and use the lowest of dosages, find the right ones instead of just going through a manual. That's what they do. They go through a manual, it's about this thick, and they go through and they find out what is the efficacy of this? What is the life expectancy percentage the highest? They deem any um, clinical trial drug or any drug 
that if it can prolong life for two months, it's deemed highly effective. Hmm. That's scary. Yeah. So you don't learn the stuff unless you research, you investigate, you, you know, these are the things that I've done over the years so I can help people educate. And then they can make the decision of what it is they want to do, but they should know. When we have a success rate of over 90% with Dr. Helu, that's massive. Traditional medicine, if it's 35% success rate, that's like beyond huge. That's like Nobel Peace Prize right there. Yeah. So we're look where we're at. So it's just other options and alternatives. No matter what, I would even say to your friend, even though she's overcome cancer and doesn't presently have it, I would say she should still have her cellular level looked at. She should still see if there's any imbalances, abnormalities, vitamin deficiencies, the permeability of the cell, the cell walls, uh, what make, you know, all these things, all the organs, the organ systems to make sure that they're functioning properly. These are the yeah. things that we do. And we, we work the body as a whole. So a lot of people want to self-diagnose and self-treat using Google doctor, Yahoo doctor. <laughs> and Dr. Helu is finding that there are more deaths on the rise because people are self-treating because they actually don't know. A lot of people don't know that they have nickel sensitivities. A lot of people don't know that they can't um, metabolize fat well. So they're going on these high fat diets like a keto diet. And actually that's creating more inflammation in the body, which can provoke cancer and other diseases. I could go on and on ladies. <laughs> Uh, you're just going to have to come back, but I, I did want to give you plenty of time because um, um, I guess the couple of things I want to be sure that we um, that we cover is I want you to have time to talk a little bit about uh, this new thing that you're launching with Dr. Hilo and, and how that's going to work and give us all the deets we want to know and take notes on that. Yes. Um, so, so Dr. Helu, he's amazing. Y'all should just look him up. Go watch the videos. Uh, he's incredible. He's just on a side note, the man speaks 23 languages fluently. I Yes, I said 23. That's not including the dialects. And for all of you Bible Jesus lovers out there, he said to me one time, uh, we talked about me being Jewish. And he says, oh, yeah, I know Hebrew and I speak it fluently. And he says, you want to know why? And I said, sure, why? And he said, when he goes, I know what it's like to be misinterpreted. And I didn't want to misinterpret God's word. So he learned Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. Wow. He studied them so that when he was reading the word of God, that he would not misinterpret and wanted to know what the, what the actual thing God was saying and revealing. I just think that's so awesome. Um, would you, has, but before you go on, tell us his full name again and, and just yeah. go ahead and give his website. How you spell the last okay. name? Yes. Yeah. So Dr. Raymond Helu, H-I-L-U, and you can find him in a couple different places. So you can find him on our website at andreathompson.org, but you can also find him at the Helu, so H-I-L-U institute.com, the Helu, and you put the first, the Helu institute.com. Uh, you can go on his website. You can learn all about the cellular analysis. Listen, it's a simple prick of the finger. Uh, you prick your finger, a couple drops of blood. People are like, why don't you need vials of blood? I'm like, because he's studying you under a microscope. So only he needs a couple drops of blood. There's like, and you can, all, the tests, we actually um, offer the tests. We sell those. They go right to your house. Uh, it gets sent to Spain. He personalized personally analyzes your blood. And you need to know this isn't for people that are that have chron just for chronic illness. This is for people that want to be preventative. So if you've never been diagnosed, praise God, and we don't want you to. But if you want to live the best life in your mind and your body and your spirit, I highly recommend that you do this. We have people all the time. We have high leading I can't, our clients, uh, I have clients, major league baseball players, entertainers, uh, high leadership um, in the Christian world. Um, we have music artists. We have down moms with 11 children. And we have, I mean, we have lots of men that are, I mean, are amazing how many men are coming on board, which is so fantastic. Children. Uh, two hours old, ba babies, infants, toddlers. We are able to help anybody and everybody. So I just wanted to say that. Um, Andrea, how much is that test? I'm sorry. The how test, much is that? Yeah. 
It's four hundred and thirty dollars, mm -hmm. and that includes the kit. That includes all the results. That includes recommendations that he'll give you, and it includes a treatment plan. Four hundred and thirty mm -hmm. bucks. I know for okay. some people that's that's a lot of money, but when you think of all the money you've spent in supplements, dieting, going to the doctors, the time you've spent trying to figure out, trying to analyze the stress of what the heck is wrong with me? And the doctors say, I'm fine. My blood work says I'm fine, but we need to see, they're not seeing you at a level that we can see you. So that for, so for 130 bucks, that's what you get. And, um, normal tests like that, which he's the only one that does that smear test. There's other tests that you can do that can, let me just say this, that can see an average of five to 20 different pathogens and balances abnormalities. Dr. Helu can see over 860. Those tests that only see that amount without treatment plans can cost anywhere from $5,000 to $20,000. Wow. Dr. is 430 because he wow. wants you well. We want to see you well. Okay, so um, Dr. Helu and I are working on some really fun things. We are getting ready to launch a subscription. It's a, it's going to have the masterclass in it already uh, that we have now, but that's going to be part of the subscription. So that'll be going away into this. We also have exclusive interviews that we did on those four pillars that I talked about that are so fascinating and learn so much. So on the diet contamination, uh, genetics and stress, uh, we have cooking classes that um, are going on there. Uh, we're going to have interviews. On, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be awesome. And so we're going to keep adding to that. So that's going to be something that's going to be available in the next couple of weeks. You can um, send an email to my team info at andreathompson.org. If you're interested and want to get on the list uh, to sign up for that, we'll probably have like a, a pre thing going on. Um, I will tell you, we were supposed to have um, uh, our cellular healing uh, conference, which was supposed to happen right before COVID hit. And it was the first time that Dr. Helu was going to be here in the United States to do a conference, not his first time in the States. But um, so we're going to be doing that again uh, next year, hopefully in the spring. So if anyone's interested in that coming out and being able to sit with the leading cellular biologists, myself, it, it's just, it's going to be incredible. Um, and again, you can get my books. I have blog posts, resources, free PDFs. Um, that you can go to on my website and download and begin to learn and be start to become the best advocate for you. That's what I want more than anything is if you could be a health coach, even within your own house, not necessarily at like me, what I do, um, but just for you and your family. So you can begin because we have our health freedoms are at, uh, uh, you know, they're on the line right now. So many things. So the more we know, the more knowledge we have, the better we're educated and equipped, the better we're going to be able to handle those pressured times when those doctors are like, this is what you have to do. And this is the only way. And you're like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Well, I, I have to say, I've, I've followed you for at least two or two years on Instagram and you I mean, I've learned so much just watching you. You do so many lives. You do so much teaching there. You have all kinds Absolutely. of recipes and everything. So I really want to uh, encourage people uh, to go there. Heather, did you did you have something you want to ask? Yeah, I, I did. I know we only have a few minutes left, but one of the things you mentioned earlier, I think it's so key, maybe you can cover for a minute, um, okay. is shame. So um, I think that there is a potential for women who maybe have gone down the other route, you know, to mm -hmm. feel shame um, yeah. or also to feel shame for having allowed thoughts and, 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 and emotional sickness to a level that actually created cancer. And how do they share that with their family? And how do they reconcile all that? I mean, I think that's important mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about. Yeah, that's good. Um, so first of all, it, I want to say that number one, if you are listening or and you are facing uh, cancer in any area of your body, name what it is, I want you to know, first of all, that that part of your body didn't give you cancer. I deal a lot with people, with clients to help them overcome uh, the mental um, aspect of what they go through, especially with, people, with women that have breast cancer. And I'm here to say like, your breasts didn't give you cancer. My cervix didn't give me cancer. And when I said earlier, knowingly and unknowingly, this is not about shaming or condemnation, but this is what I'll tell you. A couple things I've learned. 
as long as we keep things hidden inside of us and keep them locked inside of us, the enemy knows this. It's one of the biggest lies of the enemy that as long as we keep it inside us and don't get it out, we'll never completely heal. God's design for us is to completely heal. So we need to be able to speak it and get it out. It, whatever, listen, God has a plan for everybody and God's plan for how everybody should heal is different. So the way I went through something may not be the way somebody else does. Now, there are things that are black and white. We know there's very specific things that feed cancer and don't. Uh, you know, there's things going on that we can take. But here's the thing. If we can get over the shame and condemnation, one of the, in my book right here, um, I am resilient. You are all resilient, okay? This, this thing I talk about here is... We need to take accountability. The moment that you and I can take accountability, whether we it was purposely done, like me, I didn't know what I was saying all those years ago when I said I'm gonna die of a female disease. I didn't know, I was just wanting to be loved. I, I mean, I've been, I am no one to judge. I mean, you heard what I've been through and what I went through and the choices and decisions that I make, but those things do affect us. So we do need to address them. And the moment that we can just take accountability and ownership of it, then that is when we can truly heal and overcome. And it's about going from being that victim to being victorious. And it's the mindset's everything. Number one is the mindset. Yeah. And if you want to heal and you want to overcome from cancer or anything else in life, um, a, a divorce, a, a situation, it doesn't have to be a disease, so to speak, um, or emotional, anything. We have got to get a hold of our mindset and know that we have the power and the authority, just like Romans 12 too became my life verse. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I, daily, it's a daily, sometimes breath by breath thing. I tell that to some of my clients that are going through some of the darkest times of their life. But yeah. just know that give yourself permission to take accountability and ownership, whether it's been done to you or you've made a crazy decision or whatever choice down the road, or you have no idea that it was even like this potentially ha could, you know, harm our bodies, you know, just learn from it, grow from it. And well, you made a point, Cheryl, earlier when we talked about awareness. And I said this, knowledge is not power. Knowledge becomes power when you put that into motion and into action. And so when you can begin to change things over and change things over in your life, that's when you're going to see massive changes on all levels. And we were meant to thrive, not to strive. We were meant to overcome. We're meant to be healthy and to live long lives. It's a matter of if we want to. And we have to put the work in. We have to make short-term sacrifices for long-term gains. We have to do it if we want to achieve that level. Well, um, that I just I know we could talk another two hours. We're going to have to come back again, uh, no doubt about it. Well, I, I really like to close the program uh, asking you um, a question. I'm going to ask mm -hmm. that to Heather too. Um, Real quickly, what is something that you're leaning into right now? And and you can't say God and Jesus in the Bible because we know all that. that. Those are the cheap answers there. We know, you know. <laughs> the so, safe ones. <laughs> yeah, they're, the, they're, they're easy because we're hopefully we're all doing that. Tell me something you're leaning into right now. I'm actually leaning into um, making things uh, more... Um, palatable. Uh, like I created this amazing environment internally. And so now I'm actually doing that. And so I'm leaning into every area outside, like whether it's in my house or outside, I'm purposely creating space to be peaceful, to be healing, to being honorable, and really leaning into that time is very precious and very healing and healthy boundaries. That's what I'm really working on. My yeses are yeses and my noes are noes. Really good. Well, Heather, tell us something you're leaning into. We haven't heard from you for a while, and I, I know what's <laughs> going on. Tell us something well, new. Well, I have to just make a I have to make a plug, and it does have a little bit 
well, it has everything to do with Jesus, but it's a book I'm reading called, and maybe you ladies have heard of it. I know Cheryl has. I've told you about it, but it's called 100 Days in the Secret Place. And mm. um, it's a beautiful book, a compilation of writers, um, lovers of Jesus from the 1600s. And so I've been really leaning into solitude. <laughs> and solitude is not always easy. So it's very similar to what... Yeah, huh? Well, you know, it's, it, in solitude, you know, I mean, I can't go, I can't be a monk and live in a monastery, right? But there are moments, it, it's it's unbelievable to me, and I've just had this revelation about um, going inward um, with the Lord, and um, going inward into that silent place, you can actually, when, you, when it takes practice, because it's like meditating, but not emptying your mind, filling your mind with Him, um, you know, emptying our mind would be Eastern religion, right? So we don't want to yes. do that, but, but meditating on, on who He is and going inward in that quiet place in our heart and our soul and meeting him there I've had it's been so life-giving it's been so peaceful it's been so um, dramatic in my spiritual growth and my emotional health um it's been, just been incredible I can't even I just talk for an hour about it but um so yeah that's me so similar to Andrea just going inward in that peace um not looking for and even if you just have a couple of minutes if you can go into that inward place it it, it feels as if you've been in a retreat you know yes. um, it's just so uh, it just multiplies that peace going inward with him. You know, Heather, can, can I say something about that? Yeah. On a physical level, that's actually putting you into what we call parasympathetic dominant state of relaxation. And mm. that's the only place that God created us to heal, repair, and renew. So we can be in fight or flight, or we can be in rest and repair mode. And so that parasympathetic state you're creating that when you're going in there and the body's healing and responding and such. So it's physically biochemically going in and wow. doing that for you, which is, is awesome. So you're believe, creating I that environment. That. Yeah. I so believe that. Yes. You have to come back so and teach us about that. Heather, yes. about yes. that. And, <laughs> Heather, go. We're going to have to have you on again. You know, I yes. was, reminded, Thank you so much. Um, yeah, really I, awesome. I was just reminded of the spirit of Caleb, you know, um, when Caleb, when they were ready to, um, you know, go into the promised land, Caleb, who had been one of the spies with Joshua, you know, they had to wait for all of the other people to die off, right? Yeah. <laughs> so to get their promise. Uh, but Caleb said, you know, give me my mountain that God promised me this through Moses. I'm 85, but I'm just as ready to take it today as I was, um, 40 years ago. So um, I just okay. I just think that we need to have that spirit of Caleb on us as believers to stay around, to fulfill our assignment, to not give in to the way that the world does it and 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 end our lives before we accomplish what he has for us to do. We need to take our mountain. That's right. Be resilient. That's right. Yes. That's be, right. Be, be, <laughs> be resilient. You know, I've That's learned through this journey <laughs> that I'll tell you one thing. We are no good to God, others, our mission, our families, if we're sick or dead. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's, That's right. true. Well, we hope everybody will join us next week. We've got a, a couple of higher view ladies that are going to come back and tell us their cancer stories. And uh, Heather, I hope you'll be back with us next week. Andrea, do you promise to come back? I do. I, okay. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm a woman of my word. So, I yes, I would love to. <laughs> now, so. <laughs> yeah, we hope everybody has a really great weekend. Get some rest and relaxation, fresh air, some good yes. green juice, yes. and pray and enjoy the yes. weekend. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's been fun. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.